Tyler Matthews. I'm the uh, executive director for Venture Cafe St. Louis, and we're really excited to have with us today um, a panel uh, covering po powerful women in cyber. And this is an opportunity to um, help connect uh, folks that are interested and are currently working in cybersecurity. Um, as you might have seen on the site, that there is there's been a, a positive increase in women in cyber, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And we want to try and make connect the dots uh, for folks who are interested and also support people who are working in that environment currently. And so we were excited when Maryville approached us about uh, collaborating on this event. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm actually going to kick it over to Andrea and she's going to introduce our speakers and uh, kick things off. Uh, one last thing I'll note is that, um, of course, you guys have probably been, everyone's been in this uh, in a thousand Zooms for now, but just in case, uh, please keep your mics on mute. And then near the end, what we'll do is we'll take questions in the chat. So please uh, feel free to put your questions uh, throughout the talk in there, uh, just so you don't forget them. And then um, the team here will uh, surface those questions at the end for Q&A. So Andrea, thank you. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm excited to have four great panelists with us today. Um, so we're going to start off by introducing the panelists. So can you start off by introducing yourself, Alma? Hi, thanks, Andrea. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever um, you're tuning in from. My name is Alma, and um, I am originally from uh, Rochester, New York. And um, Andrea, is there anything particular that I should uh, be saying or highlighting in my, my self-introduction? Sorry about that. Can you just say like um, a little about like the field you study? Just like a small bio. So, okay. Like, you know, All path? right. Yeah. Okay, so my background um, is in international relations. I worked in international education. I am a recovering classroom teacher, a coding boot camp survivor, and currently I am working in uh, developing community relations with open source communities and doing developer relations. And I am volunteering at the cybersecurity nonprofit and finding my way into cybersecurity. As I work in a uh, small company, I am actually being able to help them a little bit with their uh, cybersecurity um, topics and issues. And um, that is essentially me. You can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I also have a YouTube channel. So that is my intro. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. Can we move on to Jessica real quick? Sure. How's it going, everybody? Um, so I guess in terms of my background, it wasn't highly technical until I actually got into the cybersecurity program at Maryville. Um, and I just graduated from that in August of 2019. So um, I've done some internships in um, like compliance and audits, those types of things in cybersecurity. And then um, I previously was working as a network analyst. Um, so that was a highly technical job. And now um, in my position at Boeing, I kind of manage configurations of um, different systems and things like that. And it's all centered around compliance um, and really having everything up to par for um, the Department of Defense. So. That's my uh, intro, I guess. And again, I only have, you know, have been doing this for maybe two years, year and a half or something, but it's been a ride. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Priya. Priya, can you go and share a little bio about yourself? Sure, yeah. Uh, hey, hey, everyone. First of all, I'm really delighted to be part of this event and thank you for having me. It, it does sound first off that I might be the oldest among the panelists. <laughs> so, uh, so just by way of introduction, I'm, I'm Priya Mauli. Uh, I'm, I'm currently, uh, I'm based out of New York and I'm a director in KPMG's um, technology risk uh, consulting practice. And um, I spent my first four years of my career as a software developer 
And then um, I realized the coding and testing was not my cup of tea, which is when I moved to do my uh, MBA. And after which I landed a job in, um, in enterprise risk strategy originally with Deloitte and then moved into cybersecurity. So um, what I do day to day is I really help work with a lot of financial services and technology companies in shaping their uh, technology risk vision. And when I say technology risk, it spans the areas of cybersecurity, privacy, data protection, and a truckload of regulatory compliance. Um, and uh, most of my recent focus has been really working with, um, um, I'd say the senior management and board to really think through that middle ground and prove that security risk and agility can coexist in the race to um, adopt disruption. So I really work with senior management and board to kind of get some security practices incorporated from the get-go instead of reacting to you know, breaches after they occur. So, so that, that covers me from a professional aspect, but then besides that, uh, the reason I'm excited to be here is that I'm very passionate about the field of cybersecurity and bringing more women to this uh, to this uh, workforce. In fact, that's one of the main reasons I kind of moved to the U.S. from India, I'm originally from there, um, uh, wherein I was under the assumption that uh, that in the U.S. I mean, for me, it was like okay, the land of dreams. So it should be 50 50, 50 of you know male and females. Uh, however, I moved to the U.S. and I saw that was not the case, which is why I'm all the more passionate about changing that. Okay, that's me. Sorry, I, that was a long intro. <laughs> I'll pause there. Thank you so much for sharing. And can you go on to finish us off with the intro, Sarah? Sorry, Andrea, you cut out there for a bit. I wasn't sure. Did you... Did you ask me to give my intro? Yes, please. Uh, well, thank you um, to Maryville and Venture Cafe for inviting me to participate in this. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Baldeo. Um, so my career actually started out in neuroscience. So I worked in the sciences and the medical in healthcare industry for a period of time. That was my academic background. Um, and as a function of my thesis work, I got very heavily involved in asset management and designing risk algorithms for the financial services industry. Uh, so I worked in that space for about three years. And then the next 13 years of my career, uh, I worked in digital transformation, uh, consulting projects for artificial intelligence, machine learning, designing neural networks. Uh, and now, uh, presently, I'm the CEO uh, at a company called IDQ. Uh, we focus very heavily on AI and digital transformation work uh, in the public sector with government agencies in the US in Canada. I'm actually, I think I'm the only Canadian here. I'm based out of Toronto. Uh, so a lot of the work that we do is with the public sector on data migration projects, um, trying to digitize public services uh, and access to those services. But, you know, I think as everyone has talked about, a great deal of my career focused on being a chief privacy and compliance officer and trying to mitigate some of the risks that there were on the regulatory compliance side as the industry kind of evolved faster than the regulatory compliance mechanisms were, were able to keep up. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you for sharing. Thanks. Thank you all for joining us, the panelists, and I'm excited to learn like a little bit about each one of you guys and like your industries and like, let's move on to the questions. Um, so the first question I have for you guys is, most of you guys answered it, but like we could go over it one more time. What did inspire you to go into the cyber like world? Anyone can answer the question. Um, I guess I'll go first. Sorry. Go for it, Jessica. Go ahead. Um, so my undergrad was actually in criminology, um, and I even did some social work for a while before I started my master's. Um, 
So I guess what really kind of spoke to me was I was looking to get out of what I was doing, but I really wanted something that um, would be, I guess, just more um, cut out for my life. So I, I looked at cybersecurity because then I could mix the criminology with um, kind of like a new field and it really intrigued me. So um, that's when I, I started out with Maryville, so. I can go okay, next. Cool. I can. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I think I, I, I spoke a little bit about it, um, but basically when I was doing my, my thesis work and practicum work um, in neuroscience, uh, that kind of, you know, channeled through my work in the early SAS revolution, and that helped to focus my interests on digital transformation and how automation was going to drive this need for cybersecurity mechanisms and process guardrails in the public and private sector. Uh, and I saw a real opportunity to kind of grow beyond um, a, a STEM background and focus more on the technology and cyber side of my career. Okay, cool. Okay, so yeah, I, I can go next. Um, so, so for me, I did not do any, I did not have any education directly related to cybersecurity. Um, so I, I uh, graduated with an engineering degree and uh, specialized in electronics and communications, after which um, in a related space, I was uh, a, a software developer. So I was doing a lot of, uh, you know, network and protocol investigation uh, type of work. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, I, I moved on to do my MBA, and um, I wanted to retain my focus on technology, though, given that I had like four years of software development experience. So I kind of specialized uh, during my MBA on, uh, you know, business management and technology strategy. And then, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, I landed a job with Deloitte in their enterprise risk strategy practice. And there, it was around all of risk, right? It's cybersecurity was one part of it, but then there was also financial risk, credit risk, market risk, reputational risk, and all of that. And then uh, in a nutshell, I kind of challenged myself to get into a new field called cybersecurity. And then little did I know that when I got into the field that it would be an ocean, right? So, so I kind of took it up as a challenge and then, you know, uh, to kind of get into the field and become a subject matter expert at the end of it. And the reason I did that was because to be able to understand the risk associated with technology, I thought that I had the, the foundational uh, education, right? The foundational education. And I also was a software developer. So I could understand how the technology was architected, how software was developed. And then I kind of challenged myself to, uh, to move to the next phase, which is understanding the risk aspects associated to it. And I feel that it has helped me because most of my day-to-day -day job as a consultant from KPMG is advising clients and talking to clients, meaning their development uh, and IT staff around incorporating security aspects. And because of my experience in software development and cybersecurity now, I am able to talk in their language and kind of obviate uh, that, that resistance to change, so to speak. I guess I'll... Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. So I I'll go I'll go next. Um, so my entrance into cybersecurity is definitely not a straight line. It is still an ongoing process. Um, my background in international relations gave me like the fundamental groundwork um, on the policy side. So on the governance and the risk and the um, the policy side. And it was actually when I was teaching online that I became really interested in computer science. So I was, I already had a career in international education. I was working with students in Europe and Asia, and um, I just wanted to learn more about the virtual learning environments. And fast forward a couple of years, I did a coding bootcamp after 
I work in an international baccalaureate school in Mexico City, and I turned out to be kind of like the IT support for an entire uh, social good project. So this was a project that was focused on bringing uh, technology and English as a second language to uh, a very economic, uh, economic vulnerable uh, segment of the population in Mexico City. And I had to basically learn on the job how to um, administer 25 IMAX to over to a school of over 300 students. And it was a very challenging and interesting um, role to have, but it also kind of helped connect the dots for me where social good cybersecurity and education kind of came together. So I am still very much, uh, one of the reasons why I, uh, if you can say fall in love with cybersecurity is that there's always something more to learn. And I really like learning how to code, um, even though that is not where my background is. I don't have a STEM uh, background, although I have taught STEM um, subjects to students in grade school and high school, it is one of those areas where there's always something more to learn. And I personally really love doing capture the flags. So um, the, the, love, the love affair continues. Well, thank you for sharing everyone for the next question. Can we start it off with Jessica? What do you enjoy the most and least about your role, your current role? Sure. Um, well, I'll touch kind of on something that Alma just said. What I enjoy most is that I learn something new every day. Um, it's never the same thing twice. And I mean, even today, it was just like a flurry of trying to figure out how to do something. Um, so that's really exciting for me. And it really makes the days fly by. Um, and I just feel like I'm gleaning a lot from it. But um, I guess in terms of like things that I don't enjoy, uh, it's sometimes hard to get enough support for anything cyber related or just security related um, in IT because typically if it's security related, it's going to be um, a little bit more difficult for users or take more implementation or something like that. So um, it's kind of hard to get people on board with what needs to be done to keep something the most secure it can be. Um, so I'd say that's probably the most frustrating part of my job. Thank you for sharing, Sarah. Do you have anything to add from like your perspective in the consulting type of world? Yeah, I definitely, so I tend to focus more on artificial intelligence and identity access management um, and the vulnerabilities um, to platforms and to certain industries from that perspective. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy most is because it's so niche uh, as a subject matter expert, when people do come to you for help, uh, typically they're very ready and willing to listen to what you have to say. Um, so I find that, you know, kind of conversely to other types of consulting work that we'll do at the firm, when we're working with clients on cybersecurity, um, there's definitely this, this willingness to participate in a productive dialogue, whereas oftentimes when you're doing consulting work, you find that you're in an ongoing battle to, to and, and that probably is what I enjoy the least, is that you're in an ongoing battle oftentimes, um, you know, to defend sometimes your subject matter expertise, particularly kind of related to that question of diversity and inclusion. Uh, as, a, as a woman, sometimes there's a lot of women in STEM, um, but not as many. Um, I think Priya, alluded to that, there's not as many as you'd like to see. So I can entirely speak to walking into a conference or walking into a room or walking into, um, you know, a, a meeting with the with the C-suite. And the assumption is often that, well, this person that's speaking is not the subject matter expert. And, and you know, hopefully when there's more diversity and inclusion, we'll, we'll see less of that. So that's one of the things I enjoy the least. <laughs> yeah. I could tell by your face that you're nodding. Do you want to share something? Yeah, I can relate a lot to that. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and actually just, uh, let, let me finish up. Just based off the last point, I actually am not very tall. <laughs> I don't like to call myself short. But then one of my mentors kind of said that you, you're a little small. So when you want to walk into a room and command the room, speak up. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was just recalling that, right? If, if you want to really be seen as a subject matter expert. <laughs> so, yes. So anyway, uh, to add on to um, what I like about the field, what I enjoy about my work is um, similar to what um, Jessica and Sarah had mentioned. I mean, things change so quickly by the day, by the minute, threat actors, I mean, hackers, I mean, it just proves that human beings are super smart and they find new, new ways of attacking systems and getting into and, and getting into other, uh, you know, information systems. Um, so, um, so the number of the diverse types of threats that are coming up and the recent breaches, right? The, the recent attacks, solar winds, and then Microsoft, um, all that, it just proves that there's so much more to learn. And uh, so, so clearly in my subject matter expertise game, I'm, I, it looks like I'm still scratching the surface. Uh, so, so that's what I love a lot about the, um, about uh, my work. Uh, the second part of it that I like is that um, it's the part around risk culture, right? To be able to allocate budget for security, I think Jessica alluded to, to this, is that you is that you first need to convince senior management and stakeholders that uh, hey, cybersecurity is for real, and I think COVID has proved that, right? It's come to the forefront. Um, so. So, you know, really evangelizing technology risk, well, it's it, to be able to do that, you really need to understand, you know, how people work, people management and psychology, right? And you, you need to be, um, you need to be creative in, in kind of articulating that message, right? It's not necessarily only in training and awareness sessions, not necessarily only in offsites, but then how do you bake in, say, good risk conscious behavior into performance management systems. So those kind of you know, creative techniques, and, and I've worked on a number of projects on that, I find, I find interesting as well. And, I, and, and to be honest, I think that can only be like the game changer to bringing security to the forefront. Um, so that's that. In terms of things that I really don't enjoy a lot is, um, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm a consultant too from KPMG. Um, there is this twin challenge to resistance, right? First of all, cybersecurity is not seen as um, is seen as a cost center, right? IT in general was seen. I think today is too seen as a cost center. So there's this challenge to first of all, hey, do we really need to implement net new controls for it? Can we go? Can we just you know, make do with the existing controls. Maybe there's a compensating control. Maybe let's just do a bandaid, right? So that, <laughs> so resistance to that is a pretty uh, challenging to deal with. Um, and the second one is, especially as a consultant. So when a third party contractor walks into an organization and says that, uh, I mean, not necessarily as an auditor, but as a trusted advisor saying that, go ahead and this would be an ideal sustainable control that you can implement so that you just fix the risk altogether and this will never resurface again. So when a third party walks in and add it to that, like what Sarah mentioned, when a woman <laughs> comes in and advises, uh, it's pretty difficult to convince and get that buy-in from, from senior stakeholders. So that is what I find a little challenging with the job. Well, I, I guess that's just the nature of the beast and we need to navigate it. <laughs> Thank you. So let's move on to the second question. Will you start us off, Alma? So as a woman in cyber, have you experienced racism, sexism, or any other form of discrimination inside in the cyber industry? Like, you don't have to share, like anyone could share, but like, if you wanna share, Alma, can you start first? Sure. So. I would say in in this in the cyberspace, no, it's been the complete opposite because one, I haven't been in this space very long. If I had had an entire career of, I don't know, 20 years, I'm sure 
I would have come across something like that because the reality is that as a woman, as a woman of color, as the queer woman of color, someone's always going to have an opinion about my existence in this world as a professional or just as a human being. So I am fortunate to be coming into cyber right now where we have some really great organizations like uh, women in cybersecurity. We have, um, we have organizations like Bridges in Tech. We have advocates like uh, Chris Roberts, who are going to use their voice and their power to be the advocate that women and people of color, the LGBTQ community need when we're not in the room, which is awesome. Um, over the summer, I was able to do a CISO boot camp with the people of Meta Defense Labs in London, and it was an extremely positive experience because one, I think like 75% of the people in the boot camp were women. The people leading the boot camp, the great majority were women working in cybersecurity. And three, um, we had access to amazing people who work in the field to mentor us and have continued to mentor us. So it's like almost a year since I did that boot camp, and these people are still available, open to chatting and to supporting us. So I think that in that sense, I've been very fortunate that I have not run into that particular situation in the cybersecurity space because I am I'm new in that sense. But you don't really have to look very far to find examples of what your question is alluding to. If you uh, uh, Google, you can Google, uh, I'm, and I'm probably going to butcher her last name, but Katie Musaris, who worked with Zoom, who worked with um, Microsoft. There is a recent article that just came out in, I think, The Verge, talking about the pay discrimination she experienced in cybersecurity. She like, she pioneered the bug bounty program at Microsoft and she experienced pay discrimination. So this is a reality that exists, unfortunately. Um, and really, I think in, instead of like having the conversation around whether or not we've experienced it, it's what is being done to make sure this doesn't continue to be an issue. There's also a really great article in Politico, in Politico, I think it's today, about how the State Department, and then this comes back to like my international relations uh, background, how the State Department is trying to make changes in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this is something that is in a, a conversation that needs to be had across all professions, but in the cyberspace, it's not just tech companies. It's also in, for example, in, you know, foreign affairs where cybersecurity is also extremely important. So with that, I will let, you know, whoever else wants to hop on this one to take it away. Thank you for sharing, Alma. I see Sarah nodding, like your expressions. <laughs> Do you want to? I'm, I'm really happy to hear about Alma's experiences, actually. Um, and I think that she raises a, a, a valid point that it, it's about the trajectory of your journey in the space. So for me, I've worked in, in tech and developing applications and UIs and UXs. I've worked on the science side and, and extensively in STEM. I've definitely experienced racism and sexism even up until now. Um, I would say that in my current work, some of the biggest frustrations facing a lack of diversity and inclusion are in political spheres where we're working on projects, maybe with state GSAs um, or government agencies. I think that there are so many, as, as Alma spoke about, there are so many wonderful resources. Like even if you think about supplier diversity, um, diversity in awarding RFPs, diversity in you know pay equity and closing that kind of gender pay equity gap. There are many, many resources, but unfortunately I do still find that when you're involved in meetings and, and, and you're involved in conversations, 
there is still racism. There is still sexism. I find that it's very extensive in the financial services industry. I've seen a lot of it. Um, I haven't seen so much of it, I think, you know, in that AI machine learning neural network space because it's so new. And I think that resonates with what Alma said. It depends, it depends where you are in your career. It depends on the level that you are at in your career and the industries that you're having these conversations about cybersecurity. So it depends who you're speaking to. And it depends on whether there's, you know, the, the industries are kind of have this foundational systemic bias built within them, or if they're very new and they were built and, and predicated on principles of diversity and inclusion, then you'll be you'll be very lucky to avoid that. So, you know, I think I think that it depends on where you are in your career. Unfortunately for me, I've experienced a lot of it. Um, to answer that part of the question in terms of, you know, how do you deal with it? I have always found that confronting it is the best approach. Uh, when you ignore racism or sexism um, or whatever kind of adversely exclusionary behaviors you're witnessing, then you're just enabling it as something that's appropriate because you're not you're not confronting it and and it that's kind of enabling what's being done so my best advice would be to just educate the perpetrators of this this negative behavior on what they're doing um, because many people are not aware of what agency penalty is they don't even realize the behaviors that they're engaging in they don't realize the types of uh, language that they're using could be offensive um, and they're just not cognizant, I think. So I think that lack of cognition um, can be very dangerous because it's a self-fulfilling mechanism when when they continue to engage in that behavior and, and nobody really says anything. And if I can add to what Sarah just said, so you, it's kind of, you know, educating the person, which that we can have a whole other conversation around unpaid emotional labor, because that's emotionally draining to so have to explain to someone why their comment or their attitudes or their just their behavior is inappropriate. But then there's the other part of like, for example, are you working on a team? Are you working um, with a partner? Are you working with a company? You need to have the conversation with your teammates, with your colleagues to let them know that that happened. You need to raise the flag. You need to say, hey, this happened with this person in this situation and it's problematic because of A, B, and C. And that's also a whole other bunch of emotional labor that it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot but it's kind of like, that's where we're at. So I just wanted to add on to what Sarah had to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and totally agree. Um, yeah, what I was gonna say is that uh, um, uh, I've actually experienced uh, quite, quite, some, um, quite some challenges as well when I just, you know, packed my bags from India, moved to the US. In fact, my very first project, yes, I was, uh, I had quite a bad experience on it, but I think it's important to muster the courage and face it, confront it like what both Sarah and uh, Alma said. Um, and I mean, not, not necessarily, not necessarily in an impolite way, right? But then really conveying the point in a diplomatic way, being very polite and explaining why so I think that is important. And then the other thing I would say is that what I actively do with my teams as I manage my teams is that in a meeting, let's say if a superior, if a superior and if a, if a male superior, no offense to the gentleman here, but then if a male superior uh, says something that I feel is not warranted, right? Like, like say, let's say a female uh, person in, in my team has a valid point to say, I would speak up and say, why do you think this is wrong, right? Me meaning you, you really make the person think in a subtle way. So, so really jump in and help your, and help your team out is, is the other um, recommendation I would give. And um, the other thing that I also actively do is that um, as part of recruiting, 
uh, we kind of involve, make sure there's a mandatory women interviewer as well. Uh, so, so that you have the bias uh, uh, perspective covered because women have a different set of questions to kind of evaluate a candidate versus a man. So, um, so we kind of incorporated that as part of the recruitment process, at least in one of the final stage interviews um, that you have a woman. Um, so that's one thing. And then another thing that I've seen that the industry, right, that many companies have adopted is, um, I believe, I want to say Starbucks, McDonald's, and the retail giants, right, like Chipotle, they have their executive compensations based out of, uh, you know, whether they're meeting their diversity and inclusion targets. I think that will be the game changer because it's some money, right? <laughs> I mean, let, let's, uh, let's all be honest. We work for a reason. So I think that will be the game changer. I mean, that just forces you to do, to change things, I guess. Yeah, and something I wanted to add to this conversation, um, and it kind of alludes to what Priya spoke to earlier too. I would definitely call myself short, um, and I think I look younger um, than I actually am. So in my previous job that was very technical, um, I was one of, I think, two women, and um, just because of the fact that I was a woman and I was small and I looked young, um, a lot of my opinions, they tried to overlook, I felt like. Um, so another thing too, um, don't only like explain what's going on or you know what have you to the person who's perpetrating that, but stick to your guns. You know, if you're sure that something that you're saying has you know, valid um, weight, just stick to it, keep repeating it if need be and come back to them time and time again and say, hey, this is what I really think needs to happen. Let's try this and just stick to your guns because eventually either it'll be a good learning opportunity for you um, or you will have proven yourself right and they'll start to take you more seriously is what I found. And to add on to what Jessica just said, in order to stick to your guns, it really helps to have like some people call them work wives, like you're like your network of people and they, they don't necessarily have to work with you, especially if you're like, like Jessica, you're on a team with just you're, you and another woman, like they, you might have to like have a professional network. Like I, men I mentioned women in cybersecurity. There's so many organizations right now. Um, women Who Code is another amazing organization that you'll find all over the world. They have their chapters. So network and kind of like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, in Spanish, it's called tejer. Uh, I'm blanking on the name. You're like so in. Knit, knit, yeah. knit your network, knit your, knit that net so that you, you have like, they have your back. So when you're like, oh, you might be like second guessing yourself, like Jessica said, stick to your guns. What helps to keep you sticking to your guns are people who have your back and people are like, no, you're, you know, you, you have a valid point and um, I'm here to support you. And how can I, how can I support you? And what do we need to do? You know, to have like that, that network, because in the end, if everybody around you is telling you, you're like, you're wrong and you, you're, you, you've done things incorrectly, you begin to doubt yourself. So to make sure that you have like the, that group of people who are going to support you and not just be like, oh yes, you poor thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who are objective and honest and truthful with you and realize that, you know, this is a problem in tech in general. Um, and they're aware of that so that they can, can they can have. And I think on that, just I like what you said oftentimes when I'm speaking to at like hackathons or or events for like young women in STEM or even like coding camps for for young women or even very very young people who are like five six years old who are girls who are going to coding camps um, lately I've started saying to them be a Kamala Harris and when somebody interrupts you which will probably happen in tech or cybersecurity, then, you know, just say, excuse me, I'm speaking. Do that. <laughs> say, excuse me, I'm speaking. And you have, you do have to be very tough 
And you do have to be willing to not only call out the behavior, but I love what you said, Jessica, to stand your ground. Because you can bet that even if you call out the, the, this, this adverse behavior, um, people are not just going to capitulate to you because you called it out or because you disagreed with them. So you, you do have to be willing to stand your ground. Thank you all for these great approaches. And that leads us actually to our second question. How can others be supportive allies in diversity and inclusion in the workplace? Priya, do you want to start us off on this one? Sorry, okay. Yeah, I was on mute. Um, yeah, so um, so I think I alluded to this point earlier, but but I think compensation would be the game changer uh, in this, uh, in in terms of you, you know meeting companies' uh, diversity and inclusion targets. But then uh, what I say, you know from an individual perspective, right, is that um, if you feel that you are not being treated on par with the rest of your peers, uh, I would say that um, seek out, I mean, especially, especially since this group is early in their career, um, seek out a mentor, meaning a coach, and a sponsor early on in your, in your career to kind of talk to you about yeah things technical skills that you want to master where you want to see yourself uh, grow but then also kind of educate you based on their experience right like what are the gotchas like what, what should they what should they look out for when they move into the corporate environment they, because university life is very different from the corporate environment so what i'd say is that actively seek out mentors and also sponsors I am calling these two out separately because a mentor is your, I would say is your active career and soft skills coach that you reach out to. And a sponsor is a person who actively advocates for you, right? So, so, so there, is, there is a difference there. They're related though, but a sponsor is, has a more active role than a mentor. So I'd say do that. Um, and also related to that, I'd say also do a lot of networking and um, engage with a lot of um, uh, people in your, in your workplace, even outside your workplace to kind of understand in general how people work, right? I know it's, I know it's, it's funny I'm saying this, but then, uh, uh, but then people management and psychology and just understanding how people from different backgrounds and cultures think will really help you in your in your corporate life uh, and um, I, i'm passing that on now to this group because i know that i didn't do a good job of it early on in my career <laughs> so so that's what i'd say uh, that's what i kind of add on to this question thank you for sharing jessica i see you over there do you want to share something with about that um yeah i guess to be an ally um in the workplace I, I think you need to actively be trying to be open to change every single day um, and be open to differing opinions. So I know it's really easy to like have your set ways that you do things. And then when somebody questions that it's easy to get defensive. Um, but if someone wants to be an ally in the workplace, I think it's really, really important to start really paying attention to that. Um, and just, you know, making a very active effort to say, okay, well, maybe I should consider this because that's how we get heard and not just immediately shut down. Is there anyone else that wants to add something to that or should we move on to the chat questions? I think, well, I, I think, would, yeah. Sorry, Alma, sorry. go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, what, what I would add to that, I, I really like what Priya had to say about uh, the difference between a mentor and an advocate or sponsor, I think Priya, that's how Priya called it. Um, but also I know that this like find a mentor, especially for younger people is kind of like, oh, how do I do that? And that's where, again, I think that professional organizations like, and I'm going to say women in cybersecurity there, we have women in cybersecurity, we have, um, uh, 
gosh, I should, I'm like, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a bunch of the women who code. Um, the International Consortium for Women and Minorities in Cybersecurity is another one. Uh, Tequeria, bueno, I'm, because I'm Latina, uh, I joined Tequeria, but Tequeria is open also to uh, people who are allies. You want to find those organizations because sometimes they actually have another great one is uh, WCAPS, Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. Um, sometimes they have like uh, formal mentoring programs. So I would really encourage people to find those professional organizations and sign up. Sometimes they cost money, but if you're a student, they usually have like reduced fees. Sometimes they're free and then ask for those mentoring programs. Um, the cybersecurity nonprofit is another great one. You can join for free and they are developing their mentoring um, program right now. So those actually kind of like take like that emotional labor off of like having to ask somebody to be your mentor because you sign up and they sign up. And um, another great one is WUMSA. I, and I'm forgetting it's what it stands for, but it's basically, it's a woman in, empowering women in cybersecurity. I signed up for, to become a member in that organization. And I have an amazing mentor who is a pen tester. Um, he, he's a man. Um, I think he's probably a little bit younger than me, but he has been so incredibly supportive and all of my cybersecurity questions is ready to, he's, he's been completely open to, and he's like one of those people who, who I know will end up not only being a mentor, but will advocate for me, ad, be an advocate for me as well. So I just wanted to add that to what Priya had to say. Sarah, did you want to add something before we move on to this? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I would think, um, I would echo what everyone has said in terms of coaching and mentorship. I think one of the things that I personally try to do is to find at least an hour or two in every week to be an ally by being a mentor and a coach, um, because. I think right now, particularly during the pandemic, everyone who is in cybersecurity and in tech and in IT and in AI, our days are more swamped than usual. So to be an ally, we could probably, you know, find that one to two hours a week to give our time as a mentor and a coach. Um, and the other criticism that I've, I've been so happy to receive as a mentor and a coach is I've been told that um, in the tech space, we tend to use exclusionary jargon that confuses people who maybe want to come into the space or they want to come into cybersecurity or into the IT space, but they just are so um, intimidated by this jargon that we use as, as industry insiders that they have no clue what we're saying. And it seems like there's this lexicon of terms that nobody could ever, it's just insurmountable. So I think, you know, one of the things we can probably do to to grow the space to include more diversity, and I think diversity is also about a, it, there's a lot of ageism in the tech space that I've had these conversations with entrepreneurs or women owned businesses where they feel, you know, they want to pivot their business where they want to have a cybersecurity implementation plan. Number one, they don't know what I'm saying necessarily all the time. And number two, it's it, they feel that there's this barrier if they're not of a certain educational background of a certain industry. Um, and, and those are just, I think, some of the things we could do to, to be allies more actively. Thank you for that. So we're running out of time, but I wanna um, go into the questions we have in the chat. So can one of you answer a question, whichever one you choose. So I'll go, I'll ask the question real quick. Some cyber jobs require US citizenship and and one company I spoke to with this past week about some of the international people I work work with requires USA, US, United States citizenship and no dual citizenship. Is the United States citizenship requirement a small percentage of fairly large in this industry? I actually tried answering that question in the chat, and that sounds to be very much like um, an organization that does work with the U.S. government. 
So it's very common that, for example, the State Department, um, in order to get security clearance, you have to you you have to have a certain list. You have to check off certain things on the list. But I also know that being a dual citizen can be a blocker to getting um, security clearance. So I, I think that has a more that that uh, point has more to do with security clearance than with being a U.S. citizen because. As far as I know, in order to have security clearance, you have to be a US citizen and you can't be a dual citizen. So because it's cybersecurity and you have to deal with like security issues, um, a lot of companies that work directly with the US government need to have their associates or their collaborators have security clearance. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Emma. And yeah. Th and thanks for the question, Betsy. So, uh, so I think yeah, um, it, exactly like what Alma said. I, I guess it's only um, if you're doing work for the public sector, if you're either consulting or if you need security clearance, you will need a U.S. citizenship. Rest assured that you can find cyber jobs that don't require citizenship as well. I am from India. I'm still a visa holder, not even a green card holder, in complete transparency. So yeah, certainly there are other jobs out there. That said though, from a visa sponsorship perspective, uh, not all companies sponsor, especially in the current COVID scenario. I, I did want to add that. So, Thank you all for like joining us and answering the questions great and like giving more than I asked for like going above and beyond to answer each question. And thank you for everybody that joined us as well. And then I'm gonna take it. So Tyler wanted to say a few words before we finish our wonderful panel. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this was great. And I really appreciate everyone uh, taking the time today. Uh, and Andrea, thank you for host uh, for moderating. Um, I did want to just remind everyone that there is actually another uh, powerful women in cyber event that we're doing with Maryville next week as well. So um, if you are uh, interested in meeting um, other women in cyber, I know a handful of the panelists from tonight will be joining us in that meetup. And the, the purpose of this will be to help make some more direct connections. So if you felt inspired tonight, um, you, you had a few questions that you weren't able to get out or didn't feel comfortable asking in the big group, um, this would be a great event to attend. And that's next week, Thursday, uh, March 25th at 5 p.m. So uh, and welcome and invite you to that as well. And um, also uh, just thanks again to uh, for Maryville for ho hosting this with us and uh, Andrea and the panel. Uh, thank you again. And I really appreciate your insights and, and, being, and sharing the information that you had with your experiences. So with that, um, if there's uh, anyone, uh, uh, panelists, if you, if, you, if you feel comfortable putting uh, uh, information on how to best reach you, if they have any further questions, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, with that, we'll, we'll end the discussion today and we'll keep the, the, uh, the window open here for a little bit so that way you can uh, go through the chat to get that information and uh, go to venturecafestl.org for information on the meetup next week. So thanks everybody, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, our pleasure. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. And uh, we will see you hopefully next week.